And here we go. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the latest installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, Advanced Analytics with William McKnight, sponsored today by Cambridge Semantics and TigerGraph. William will be discussing graph databases on the edge today. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag ADV Analytics. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the bottom middle of your screen for that feature. And if you'd like to continue the conversation after the webinar, you can follow William and each other at community.dataversity.net. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me turn it over to Steve for a brief word from our sponsor, Cambridge Semantics. Steve, hello and welcome. Well, hello, Shannon. Thank you, very, thank you very much for inviting me. Let me just get my slides up and running here for you. Um, thanks very much to uh, William Knight and for, to Shannon for giving me a couple of minutes uh, here. Um, you know, I work for Cambridge Semantics. Uh, we make a graph database that's an RDF triple store. And in the, gra in the, gra the graph database world, there are a couple of different types of graph databases. There are property graphs and RDF triple stores, and so we make an RDF triple store that also supports uh, property graphs, uh, and it supports uh, property graphs under this new standards, new proposed standard uh, from the W3C. So really, that's my commercial for today. Um, but one of the use cases for for using a graph or an RDF triple store with property graph is that you can create a knowledge graph. And knowledge graphs are a really great thing. Not all graph databases are really good at creating uh, a knowledge graphs. So let's just talk a little bit about this use case. Um, you know, uh, a knowledge graph is really uh, put together when you want to uh, integrate data from multiple data sets, both structured and unstructured data, and leverage, uh, you know, ontologies and standards in order to put the, that data together. And that data may come from text or unstructured data. It may come from a standard Oracle database or an object store like an S3 bucket. Uh, it may come from Elasticsearch or NLP processing. You want to take all that data, you want to put it together and build a knowledge graph with a combined understanding of all of that data. Uh, we've been trying to do this for a long time. We did it with data lakes. We've done it with, um, you know, uh, 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 data warehouses. Um, but this is a new way to create a knowledge graph and integrate these data sources together. And I think it's a superior way. Um, one of the things that when you're building a knowledge graph, you, there's some things that you'll need, some functionality that you need. You'll need to leverage diverse uh, data sets. So you want to pay, take the output of an NLP. You want to take structured and un unstructured data and put it out uh, and use it as part of your knowledge graph. Data is never perfect. There are nulls. There are, uh, there's data that uh, you know, doesn't conform necessarily to standards. So you want to make sure that when you're leveraging that, uh, you can leverage some of those standards and, and, and contexts for putting that data together. Of course, you want to perform analytics on it, and you want to not only perform graph analytics, but you want to do deep analysis, BI-style analytics. Uh, you want to do averages, uh, aggregate functions. Uh, maybe you want to even do some uh, uh, precursors to machine learning and data science. So you want to be able to do a wide variety of analytics, and of course, you want to be able to scale. Now, in my use case here, I, I have a very simple graph where we have uh, a customer records data set. Sue and John are in our customer records. Sue is married to John. I'm, I'm going to, for my knowledge graph, pull together uh, DMV data. So I know that John drives a Ford, and that's in, in, information from that data source. And then I may also want to pull together credit bureau data. So here I, I see that John has a credit score of 710. So for my knowledge graph, I might want to ask, give me all the information about John, tell me all the people who have a credit score of 710, tell me all the people who drive Fords. I want to be able to spin around and look at this data from different angles. Now, if I were to do this in a standard relational database, uh, I, I have a lot of steps that I need, would need to go through. So I have to design and implement schema, understand which data sources I want to integrate, uh, build business glossaries or functions around that, plan for data lineage, 
make sure that when I want do these joins and do this an, an, do these analytics that I'm not over taxing the system. So my metadata management has to be structured that way. Then I go and I can import the data and I have to think about workloads. I have to think about how I handle that relationship data that's in the data. So John is married to Sue. Uh, you know, do I take that and put that in a separate table? Do I throw it away? I, I want to be, have, be able to handle all of that. Then I do the analytics and, you know, usually I do the analytics that I thought about in step one. And if I try to do analytics that um, are new and that I haven't thought about in the beginning, it may take a really long time and I have to go do uh, this extra step or some tuning with, with the database. And then if I want to do something like page rank or shortest path, again, that's going to be a lot of machinations, a lot of tough stuff. If someone then comes along and says, hey, add this data source, Let, let's add an additional data source to this, then I might even have to go back and refactor or create an operational data store in order to get, get that analytics done. Now with graph databases, particularly knowledge graphs created with RDF and um, you know, uh, an OLAP RDF like we are, you can kind of throw away a lot of that steps, those steps. You know, we are storing subject predicate object. We're storing a very simple data model. So in my case, uh, we can store away the fact that John has a credit score of 710 in a subject predicate object style. Uh, John is a subject. This concept of having a credit, sco a credit score is the predicate, and then the score of 710 is actually the object. And with the addition of properties now, we can also add things like provenance. So uh, a property might say, according to TransUnion, or it might say, John has a credit score of 710 on X date. Right? And those are the properties that we can add to this as well. Now, we, can, you know, we don't have to really worry about designing schema. We don't have to plan as much for joins or data lineage. Uh, data quality will come as part of the process that we have with uh, using ontologies, and I'll talk about that in a sec. And then uh, you know, in terms of importing data, I can import all the data in this triples format. Um, and um, you know, there's no specific tables needed, and the processes are very simplified. When I come to the analytics part and I start asking questions, I can ask anything and turn it on its head and ask it from any angle. I don't have to worry about how the data is optimized as much, and therefore I don't really have to refactor as much. So then, the, you know, there is this whole concept of, with RDF stores in particular about using ontologies to provide extra context, classification, and equivalencies. So, you know, I can uh, leverage some existing ontologies or build my own ontologies and come up with standard nomenclature for things. I can come up for classifications with things, and then I can use inferencing as part of the ontology. So some examples of that here, I, you, I see, you know, I can, I can call a cat a feline uh, or a cat. Um, I can also know that a cat is a mammal and a carnivore, and I can use that in the context of the database when I'm doing analytics. So if I want to see all the carnivores in my database, uh, you know, cat will come up as part of that. So that's the classification part of ontologies. And then also I can do this inferencing where if I know that John is married to Sue, I can infer that Sue is also married to John and that will be relevant for my analytics as well. Uh, the good part is that Dataversity does have a lot of great information on that. So if you do a search in Dataversity on ontologies, um, great information, great articles on there. There was a article just this week from Thomas Frizendale on data modeling and creating knowledge graphs. Uh, really good timing, uh, Thomas. So, um, you know, if you get a chance to take a look at that article, that, that information is there on, in Dataversity. So just to wrap up, uh, you know, we do provide Ansograph DB, which is one of the fastest RDF triple stores that's on the market. Uh, it supports data harmonization through RD, the RDF data model. It supports analytics, both graph algorithms and BI style analytics. It supports ontology, reasoning, context uh, through RDFS and OWL. And so we can help you with building that process. Uh, if you want to try it, you can go to anzograph.com and download it, or feel free to shoot me an email. We can talk about your project as well. Okay. Thank Steve, you. thank you so much for kicking us off. If you have questions for Steve, feel free to submit them in the Q&A section in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, as he will be joining us in the Q&A at the end of the webinar. Now let me turn the, it over to our second sponsor for today for, to hear Grav talk about TigerGraph. Rob, thank you so much for joining us. Excellent. Thanks a lot, everybody. I hope you can see my screen clearly. Yep, Let's jump looks right good. In. in the interest of time, I'm going to finish. 
Vice President of Marketing, and thank you for this opportunity, Data Diversity. And thank you for hundreds of you that have taken time out of your busy schedule to join us today. So first I'm gonna talk about quickly about the evolution of databases, because one of the most common questions I get when I say we are a graph database and analytic solution, they're like, what is this graph database? How is it different from a relational database like Oracle or DB2? How is it different from a key value database like MongoDB, for example? And this is a simple chart that shows you those differences. The first one, relational database was built in 1970s. So whenever you're trying to understand relationships, essentially what you're doing is each data domain, like product, customer, order, supplier, location, are all uh, saved in separate tables. And you're doing complex table joins. So as your length of the table grows in terms of number of rows, and as you, as you join across multiple of these tables, it becomes computationally very expensive. And that's why analytics have been so slow with relational databases, especially deeper analytics. E-value databases came along, came into their own last decade and this decade. And solutions like MongoDB are fantastic because they don't require any hard schema. You can store any type of data that you want in there. The problem is everything is stored typically in a large table, a single table with billions of rows. So when you're trying to do analytics, you are essentially scanning the same table multiple times, and that basically means that it's slow in terms of deep analytics. When you look at graph databases, all of these business entities, product, customers, payments, order suppliers, are pre-connected, and therefore it's much, much faster to do relationship analysis and get new insights off of that. We use graphs every single day. So every time you're using Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, you're using a graph database in the back end. So when you search for Gaurav Dishpande on LinkedIn and you see that you're connected to be a second or third level of connection, that second or third level of connection information is coming from a graph database. Every time you're running a search on Google, it's using PageRank, which is a classic graph algorithm. Every time you're shopping on Amazon and Wish.com, the product recommendations that come up to say, hey, you might be interested in these products, that's directly off of a graph database. Now, Wish.com, is a tidy graph client. And with that, my next chart is that not only you use a graph database every single day, you use tiger graph every single day. So a lot of you, over 300 million customers shop at wish.com. It's a very popular website for casual items under $50. And if you're shopping at wish.com, your recommendation engine that's powering that site is tiger graph. If you go to your local restaurant and two out of those three use includes QuickBooks payments, which is a payment gateway, the fraud detection for that is with Tiger Graph. So every day, millions of customers are benefiting off of fraud detection with Tiger Graph. If you're using Zillow to look for a home, the popular website, that is the recommendation for the homes that come back to you. So they will send you, they'll show you recommendations on the site to say, these are the homes that you might like based on your prior browsing and search history. That's Tiger Graph. When you get emails from Zillow that says, here are the homes that you might also like, that recommendation is tailored to your particular browsing and search, that's Tiger Graph. If you watch HBO at home, if you watch Game of Thrones, Westworld, Chernobyl, any of those, we are working also in the back end to do entity resolution and recommendation for you. So with that, let me take an example from a financial services industry for fraud detection, one of the most popular graph use cases. So here we have, so take any uh, payment provider like Venmo, PayPal, Square, doesn't matter. You have a, typically have a user, a user one, creates an account one. They typically do a two-factor authentication, so they use phone number one, as well as email to set up their account, and that account will be linked to an American Express card. So far, everything is okay. That particular user initiates a payment, which is payment one. That payment one is initiated using a device. It's an Apple iPhone 6 device and that's then associated with the phone number and an account. That's going to account to that link to Bank of Montreal. When you look at this information, there's nothing alarming about this. So when you look at the user for this particular account, who's receiving the money from user one, there's still nothing concerning about it. So regular analytics would go in, in the matter of three hops, right? Looking at the payment going from account one, 
uh, to account to and then on to the user for the account since user one user two are all brand new there is no prior history for either of these users or these phone numbers or these emails nothing is flat so if you look at this particular scenario regular analytics says everything is good no fraud here now when you drill down deeper and you go deeper from the user to to the phone number that was used for authentication for two factor authentication to the device which was used for that for with that particular phone number you go back and you look at the history of the device and a graph database like tiger graph would find essentially that this particular device was used for a fraudulent transaction so essentially now starting with the user going to the phone number going to the device and then looking at prior prior history of payments that were sent with that device you find that in six hops with deep analytics with tiger graph you've actually found the culprit and this particular transaction is likely to be fraudulent and it's stopped in real time. So that's what we do for many of our customers from other largest banks in the world. In fact, four out of five largest banks in the world use Tiger Graph for fraud detection. That's one of the most popular use cases, recommendation engineers and others. So that's what I wanted to mention quickly. Now, with respect to performance, you know, we are about 40 to 337 times faster than other graph databases. You can find the benchmark right here. I'm not going to delve too much on it. Just mention that the fact that the performance is faster basically means lower cost of ownership for you. That's the first part. And the second part, you need a lot less hardware. And the second part is you can do things in real time that are possible to do with large data sets that you can't do with other graph databases. Last but not the least, um, how do you get started so with Tiger Graph? We have a cloud offering. It's a public cloud offering. Best part is you can go to tigergraph.com forward slash cloud and register for free. We have a free lifetime tier for non-commercial usage. So if you are looking to just learn graph database, learn analytics, you can literally start in minutes. In five minutes, you can register at tigergraph.com forward slash cloud. You can select a starter kit for a use case like fraud detection, like recommendation engine, like customer 360, like enterprise knowledge graph. And you can start to explore the data with our data science workbench, which is Graph Studio. You can build literally in hours your proof of concept. We provide you with a seed amount of money as well as the free tier that is free for lifetime. You can start to build your POC for free right now at tigergraph.com. And there are over, actually there are, that number is old, 12, we have over 15 starter kits now with pre-built schema, with pre-built set of best practice queries and a sample data set. So all of that is included and you can literally instantiate all of that stuff in five minutes at tigergraph.com. Lastly. Graf, thank you so much. And uh, if you have any questions for Graf, we will be, um, he will be joining us as well in the um, Q&A portion of our presentation at the end of the webinar today. And thanks to both sponsors for helping make these webinars possible. I just want to introduce our speaker for the series, William McKnight. William is the pre president of McKnight Consulting Group, which focuses on delivering business value and solving business problems, utilizing proven, streamlined approaches in information management. And with that, I will give the floor to William to get today's webinar uh, started for the hello and welcome. Hello and thank you. Um, I trust you can see my screen. If not, please let me know. Um, all right. So uh, I'm just really excited uh, to be here today and sharing with you this very important topic about graph databases. I have been able to take some clients from absolute zero into the graph world and they are over the moon about some of the things that they're able to do with the graph, even things that we didn't envision when we got into uh, the graph database initially. So uh, my passion is, and maybe you've picked up on this over the past uh, year of these events, my passion is getting clients into the right architecture, the right platforms, and the right tools to succeed with data. And being that, as my passion, uh, that has led me very distinctly into the graph database world. So I'm really excited about what graphs can do. I think the idea that Everything being in rows and columns is going to eventually, in short order, be a thing of the past. Uh, SQL becomes less important and the technology evolves, the technology behind data is going to be, to be evolving and graph is going to be highly relevant in that future. I think of it like a Venn diagram. There's things that databases can do, that is relational databases, and there's things graph databases can do really well. Now, let me say, you can get there from here. If you're just in a relational world, you can do almost probably, well, I'll say you can do all the things that I'm going to be talking about here today. 
and all the things you heard from Gaurav and all the things that you heard from Steve. However, you're, good, you're doing it the hard way. And doing it the hard way means you may not even get to uh, any kind of great end result. Corporations aren't great at doing things that are hard. They want to do things that are easy. They want to do it the easiest way. And I hope to show you some of the things that you can do the easy way with graph databases today. And speaking of that Venn diagram, if anything, the graph side of it is pushing over pretty hard now, I'd say, into the relational side. So let's see if you agree as I go on here. And I'm basically double-clicking into some of the things that Steve and Grov talked about today. Um, and I think you've come to the right place if you want a total hour immersion in graphs um, based upon what I heard from them. Uh, so here are some examples, uh, and there are many. I just want you to know that this is proven technology. This is out there, uh, has been running in production for many years in many different types of industries, but it is centered around a, a set of use cases, and Grob got, kind of got into this. Uh, I think these clients kind of represent some of those use cases. So GameSys is going to know in its games um, who's connected to who, which enables them to do the right thing by their customer to reduce churn. Uh, Crunchbase is uh, a, a purveyor of business connections and business information. Obviously, that environment has gotten nothing but more complicated, and they use graph databases to keep track of all of that. And then the, we have various uh, retailers like Walmart and eBay. Every, anytime you see a you might like because of your pattern, you might like this, that, or the other thing, um, that's probably coming from a graph database uh, where, where those connections are made much more readily. eBay, uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but every screen they render is unique, and they keep track of it, and they keep track of its performance. And now all that goes into the mix when they decide the next screen to produce for you and everyone. So yeah, that's a lot of information. Uh, Telenor is a telecom. Telecoms are actually very uh, big on graph databases, and they're able to know, obviously, who you're calling, who you're texting, and that sort of thing. They know the impact of doing various things uh, to customers in terms of how that's going to ripple through the network. They also know, based upon patterns, where to shore up their network because the network uh, uh, plays right into the graph database concept. So some of these are recommendation engines, fraud detection. Goab talked a lot about this. And by the way, a lot of fraud detection today, it's not individuals anymore working in isolation. It's a lot of groups of criminals that are working in real time and trying to fool the system. And so graph databases need to be fast to, to get right on that right away. And uh, we've seen fraud go down, I think, as a result of graph databases. And I think the origin of um, another thing I'll mention is uh, traffic route optimization. That's a big one. Social network analysis and genome and other forms of scientific research. As a matter of fact, I think the genesis of graph databases came from the scientific community. And Steve kind of touched on this when he talked about shared ontologies. Graphs were built to share ontologies in a format that lend itself to those ontologies. And that was graph. And now we have so many more applications of it. So don't take my word for it. Here's some quotes from Gartner recently about the intended uh, or the expected growth in graph databases. So I think they're going to grow something like this. I think they're going to grow in your shop, in every shop, that is. And uh, I think what's going to make it grow is education. As people get more exposed to graph and what they're all about and the algorithms behind it, and they learn that, number one, it's more than the social graph. Grob talked about the LinkedIn graph. I might do that as well two or three times uh, in the next uh, half an hour. Uh, yeah, that's important, but that's only the tip of the iceberg in terms of what graph can do. And also, some people think about graph as that great visualization. It's a great way to see data. Yes, it is. That's part of the value proposition, but there's so much more. And the thing I like to share is the algorithms because that helps you to see the, the relative importance of the actors in your network. So this might be people, this might be products, this might be sites, uh, parts, all kinds of things uh, can go into a graph database. And by the way, every graph database is not uh, filled with homogeneous uh, nodes. In other words, all the nodes look alike. Okay, so 
let me back up. Graphs are based on vertices and edges. So let's talk about that. I want to get the terminology down for you as we go into this a little bit more. So what can be vertices? Let's start with that. These are basically the nouns of your organization. They're the major nouns of your organization. Now, you don't just want to put all nouns that you can find in your company into a graph database as vertices, right? But you do want to put the ones in there where a change in one of the vertices has an impact on adjacent and other vertices. So we're trying to determine impact and relative importance and passing and things like that. So this ends up being a lot of the people, your customers, employees, and so on, a lot of B2C customers, that is, uh, people in companies or the companies themselves, different places, obviously mapping type of applications lend, lend themselves very well to graph databases, and the various things of your business, bank accounts, all kinds of contracts, and so on, your products, and so on. So these vertices, so-called, uh, are connected by edges, which are the relationships. So I might say relationships, I mean edges. Edges are like, for example, this could be a passenger that takes a bunch of airline flights or a piece of information that's passed from one person to another person in a social network or computer user or a piece of software visiting a sequence of web pages by following links. Um, one, of the, one of the examples that really demonstrates this to me is I had the opportunity a few years ago to be part of a, a scientific a company doing graph databases, and they have this worldwide reach, and they have, they work on DNA, okay, way over my head, but the point is there's various sections of the DNA, and they wanted to understand who's working on some similar section of the DNA that I am so we can share information, and that was captured in a graph database and shared so that the scientists who were working on various areas of the genome could share their research and make it go up exponentially as a result. Speaking of employees doing things, another way to represent uh, some graph capabilities is with the employee graph, because now a lot of these systems that manage employees, you know, manage benefits and, and so on like that, they also keep track of all the connecting points within the employee group. So you go to meetings with certain people, you call certain people, you text certain people, you're on emails with certain people, so that's a way to understand what the various clusters of people are within an organization. So sometimes graph databases uh, and graph database possibilities are built into the products that we're now buying. Okay, here's another example. This is an example of the speed of graph databases. Okay, so there's the functionality, but there's also the speed. And this goes to show you that every node doesn't have to be uh, heterogeneous because you may enjoy the performance performance, did I say heterogeneous, I mean homogenous, you may enjoy the performance of the graph database. So this represents that. So in this experiment, we got a thousand people, an average of 50 friends per person. Um, that sounds like a lot to me, but maybe I just need to get out more, but let's just say they have 50 friends per person, and there's an algorithm for path exists, you know, limit to a depth of four. So what we're getting here into is four levels of friends. We want to report with up to four levels of friends for each person. In a relational database, as you can see, takes up to, say, 2,000 milliseconds. In a graph database, two milliseconds. And here's the kicker on this. Even if the number of persons were raised, I don't know, a thousand fold, the performance doesn't change. It's still a couple milliseconds to do this. And so that's one of the, uh, one of the ways that I think that it scales because the performance scales no matter how many nodes you get in the network. So you might say, well, okay, that's a little bit more of the example, the social graph. I know about the social graph. Gaurav talked about the social graph, the LinkedIn graph, and so on, but what about what other you know, things can it do? So here's an example with heterogeneous nodes. So this uses healthcare fraud, okay? So we're monitoring drugs and treatments, we got prescribers, we got consumers, we got some different looking uh, vertices in this graph and some different edges as a result. So, because patients are connected to doctors and pharmacies and so on. So we're trying to find excessive relationships here. We're trying to find doctors who are over prescribing certain drugs. And um, as you can imagine, that's pretty important. 
So graph databases are used to look at relationships, look at which relationships are uh, well beyond the norm, and those are relationships that the company will want to drill into to get a handle on this situation. So there's some examples, I'll have more, but relations, relational databases can handle data relationships very well. Now before graph databases came along, I've been in this business a long time, uh, I've tried to do some of these things, right? Clients demanded it, I tried to do it. A lot of it comes down to self-referencing tables, self-referencing tables, which get pretty complicated and which do, does not perform very well. And I do not have an example of it, but the, the SQL behind that uh, can get pretty long and complicated, whereas the, uh, the uh, corresponding data access layer for a graph database would be far less than that. So database options are not suited to model or store data as a network of relationships. The performance will degrade with the number and levels of relationships. That makes it harder to use for real-time applications. Let me build this out here, some of the things I wanted to say about it. And this is not flexible as well to add or change relationships in real time. So again, I think the thing that's going to drive graph databases out there is education because this resonates with a lot of people at a technical level. Oh yeah, I've been trying to do these things, but I've been trying to do them with relational databases and it's hard and it's slow. Maybe there's a better way. And actually I think it, there's a better way with graph databases that you can jump onto pretty quickly, pretty quickly. You might want to try some of the free versions of our sponsors here, Cambridge Semantics and Tiger Graph. And, um, so proud to have two of the leading graph databases as sponsors for this. What we're looking to do is find fit for purpose platforms, fit for purpose platforms. Use the right database for the right job. Now, nobody is here saying that, uh, well, you know, use graph databases for everything, right? Uh, there's a place for the data warehouse. Uh, there's a place for cloud storage. There's a place for other forms of relational databases in the enterprise. But when it comes to connected data, and I'm going to give you some tips here to help you know where to uh, find the workloads that make sense for graph databases. When it's connected data, you can't beat the graph database. Now, before I jump into the algorithms, I just want to show you this as an example graph visualization because a lot of you may have seen stuff like this but now you're going to know that comes from a graph database. And I really enjoy the visualization. Uh, my analysts uh, enjoy the visualization aspect to graphs. You can drill, drill into these vertices and learn more. You can pinch, you can focus in certain areas. And where, where this is really good is when you can, you can pull out and see the big picture, and then you can say, well, I wanna see more in this area draw a square around it, and you're drilling in, and it's a beautiful thing. Now, let me talk about the graph algorithms here, because this is, to me, this is what sets graphs apart. It's not the visualization, that's great, all right? It's not necessarily the homogenous nodes, the LinkedIn kind of thing, social graph, that's great too. But these algorithms can help you determine, again, the important nodes in your network, the important components of your business for a given situation or just in general. So the first one I want to talk about is page rank. And I think, uh, I think Steve talked, uh, or, you know, alluded to this. Now, let me first say <laughs> it's an art form to describe page rank. And I hope I do it justice here, uh, but it's easy to get kind of your tongue twisted, but I've done it a few times. So let me see. Uh, I will start by saying that this is one of the things that really made Google a success. Okay. And uh, Larry Page is uh, one of the founders of Google, recently stepping down. Um, but uh, uh, this was his uh, brainchild back in the day. And it also is a coincidence, I guess, that <laughs> the pages are actually web pages. So for those two reasons, uh, we now are stuck with page rank. But it makes sense. And this is, again, what set Google apart because they, they said about it, about doing this, uh, you know, determining what websites to show you for a search, they set about to do it in an automated way, this way, as opposed to Yahoo that did it the old manual way. 
and it was a very inconsistent way. So what Google decided is, hey, you got a website out there, and you got a bunch of websites pointing to your website. Well, your your website must be important, but it goes well beyond that because it it depends how important those sites are that point to your site to determine the importance. I could have a hundred. Uh, websites pointing to my web page, but if they're not important, neither is mine. Some of you may remember the back in the day when uh, if you ever had a website and you were ever doing any kind of SEO on it, right? Some people said, well, hey, let's just create a bunch of these dummy websites and point to my website and it'll look important to Google. And that's the goal here. Well, Google smoked that out with stuff like this and that is no longer going to work for you. Now, Quickly, page rank. Um, each of these pages is, is, is given some level of importance. They're also given a, and I'm going to throw this in there, uh, the damping factor. And so there is some merit to the fact that somebody might just type in my website, mcknightcg.com, and come onto my site uh, directly without clicking through on somewhere else. Uh, and so the magic number for that is was 0.15. It was sort of a magic number for Google back in the day. So every website is going to get that. Now, putting that aside, and if you didn't follow that, that's okay. You, you'll still get the gist of this. We're trying to determine which of these web pages is most important. So if I'm doing a search, Google's trying to determine which websites to show me. All right, so page A points to page B, page B points to page C. So in other words, page A is, well, page A also points to page C. So page A is giving half of its importance to page B and the other half to page C, whereas page B and D are giving all of their importance to page C. Isn't that nice? So let's go through an iteration of this. And there you see the damping factor is included, uh, which is 0.15. So everybody has 85 cents to give out. Let's think of it that way, 85 cents to give out. Well, page C decided to give it all to page A. Page A decided to give half of that, what is that, 42 and a half cents to page C, and the same amount to page B, and so on. So if we get into the results of this, after one iteration, we see that page A has its damping factor, plus it has 85 cents for page C. So its total is one, okay, kind of boring. Page C has its damping factor, but it also has all of the 85 cents from page D, from page B and half of it from page A. Wow, nice, nice sum there. It looks pretty important. Well, you go on and on, you iterate, and hopefully the light bulbs are going off on this. And after a certain number of iterations, it gets to a point where it's not changing anymore. We call that convergence. And as a result, uh, after 20 iterations, we get to convergence. We find that the most important web page, probably no surprise if you were paying attention, is page C with a number of uh, 1.58 page A shortly behind because page C increases page A's importance. Page C being so important now, as you can see, giving all that to page A makes page A important. So if you can get some of the bigger websites pointing to your website, good for you. That's going to be nothing but good. But that's page rank and that's websites, all right? We're not all dealing with that. But think about the other vertices of your business and how page rank might apply there and might help determine which of those are most important. Now let's get into some of the other algorithms, some of the other main algorithms. So between this, this is a centrality measure. Centrality is a big word in graph databases. Yes, there is a little terminology here. And centrality means that that node or that vertice is central to the network. A lot of other paths come through that vertice. So it's central. It's, it, it has high centrality, we say. Betweenness is a centrality measure of a vertex within a graph. Betweenness centrality quantifies the number of times a node acts as a bridge along the shortest path, and I'll come back to that, the shortest path between two other nodes. So it measures the importance of a vertex by counting the number of shortest paths that pass through. So if this were the LinkedIn graph, some of the nodes with high centrality would be, well, let's not say LinkedIn, let's say a Twitter, all right, uh, more relatable. So uh, the Oprah Winfrey 
uh, note would be very important because of all the connections and all the important people that connect to her as well and that sort of thing. So if you're highly popular in that way, you're going to have high centrality, high betweenness, and so on. Betweenness, another way to say it is it measures the degree to which a process participant controls information flow or money or disease or whatever it is that you're passing. They act as brokers. The higher the value, the higher the information flow traffic that moves from each node to every other node in the network. So an example of this might be if you look at the highway map of the United States, cities in the Midwest or in the middle of the country, like I'm here in Dallas or something like Chicago or St. Louis, they have higher centrality because there's so many shortest paths that can bind any of the cities on the east and the west coast and have to pass through them. So that's a way to look at centrality, the way to, to look at importance. Closeness is the shortest path between any two vertices. So some of you know the game Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon. So apparently um, every other actor in Hollywood is somehow connected to Kevin Bacon by no more than six degrees, either in movies that he's been in or shared directors or so on and so forth. Um, now, if we divide one by the average shortest path from an individual to all other individuals in the network, then we have calculated their closeness centrality. So if you're looking for closeness, the closer you're going to be to one, the, the more centrality, the more importance that you're going to have in this network. So individuals who connect to most others through many intermediaries get closeness scores that are increasingly nearer to zero. So you're, you're, this is a way to, sh to show how central you are to the flow of information in this network. And so therefore, because we know about marketing dollars, right? We have to know that uh, we're not wasting half of it, but we don't know which half. That's old. We can't do that anymore. We have to know where to focus. And stuff like closeness helps us focus. And then there's eigen centrality. Yeah, funny words, but it's a measure of the importance of a node in the network as well. So it assigns relative scores to all nodes in the network based on the principle that connections to high scoring nodes contribute more to the score of the node in question than equal connections to low scoring nodes. So for example, uh, here we see the orange node in the middle here. It must be pretty important. Why? Only three connections. Only three connections, but there are two people that uh, have a lot of connections otherwise. So you might say, well, in the middle there, we got the CEO. He only talks to the sales managers, and they talk to all the, 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 the members of the sales team. So therefore, the CEO is most important. And then we have stuff like clustering coefficient with cascading churn. And so if two people churn, what is the likelihood that others will? There you see, uh, it's not SQL, it's one of the graph languages, but it's very, very similar to SQL. You'll catch on to it if you know SQL. And I'm trying to show you here how short the, the, the query language is to do some pretty complicated things. So. Think of the, the question, if two people turn, what is the likelihood others will? Gone are the days when that's going to take, you know, an IT project to be uh, multi-month and so on and ultimately not get done because in a graph database, that can get done. And then we have loopy belief I wanted to share with you. I know another, another funny word. There is some terminology here. This is where we might compute data into the graph that doesn't exist but probably should so that we can do all the other things that I just talked about. So it's a way to get at missing data and impute it into the network. Loopy belief propagation is one method of filling in missing information so that we can utilize these great networks even if we are missing information. So those were some of the main algorithms that I want you to know about as you think about your workloads and think about what might fit in a graph database. Here are some of the questions. If you're asking these questions, then uh, you, uh, you may have a strong candidate for graph database. In what order did a specific set of related events happen? Are there patterns of events in our data that seem to be related by time? And so on there. I keep thinking I'm, I'm about to say, uh, you might be a redneck if, well, your, your workload might be fit for graph database if any of these questions make sense to you. If the workload is identified by network, 
hierarchy, tree, ancestry, structure. If that's how you describe a workload, um, I got to tell you, if you're describing it that way to me, some warning bells are going off and I'm rubbing my hands together thinking about graph database solving that workload. If you're planning to use the relational performance tricks, um, self-referencing tables and so on, to try to get there the hard way, you might think about the easier way here. If your queries are going to be about pathing, what is the path between two of the players in my two of the elements, or you know, I want to say vertices, but uh, nouns in my business? Yes. You are limiting queries by their complexity. You're not doing things that you would like to be doing because it's too complicated. That's another sign. You are looking for non-obvious patterns in the data. So a quick POC with a graph database may impress you to where you'll want to go forward with it. Now let me talk a little bit about graph modeling. Now we don't model, we, well, this is how we model. We model at the domain level. We have to know what some of the vertices are going to be and what some of the edges are going to be. So an employee might sell an order, order might have a product, supplier might supply that product, and that product is part of a category, and so on and so forth. At this level, this is the level of modeling that you want to do uh, before you get into your graph database application. And so the employee, product, supplier, order, and category, and so on are going to be the vertices of this. And the edges are going to be things like sold, things like product ordered, things like supplied, or things like part of. It's a beautiful thing. Model actions depending upon you, what you want as vertices. So there's different ways to skin this cat. I don't want to get into too great detail here today, but if you're thinking, well, I don't know if it's this or that, and therefore I'm confused. Well, it might be, might be either one. That's, a, that's perfectly okay. So Bill might send an email to Jim. The email might be a vertice, or emailed might just be an edge. If you don't want to keep track of the email as a vertice, both are acceptable. It all depends upon you and what you want to be as a vertice, what things you want to see importance of. Then you have a semantic graph that both of our sponsors are, are way into this, right? This is the model that they are. So you might have John knows Frank. Uh, how does John know Frank? What is the providence of that? What is the confidence percent that I can apply to this relationship? How certain am I that John knows Frank? It may not be 100%. So in there, there may be 10 other types of, of things that you might want to put there as edges. So we store this in what's called a triple, right? Okay, triple, uh, Steve alluded to this, subject, predicate, object. So we have a few going on here. I'll point them out. One subject is John Peterson. He knows, and that's the predicate, and the object is Frank T. Smith. So that's actually stored. That's how it's stored. You know, a relational database stores data with all of the columns of the table and a graph database stores a triple, sometimes known as a, a uh, quad store, which effectively is the same, in case you hear that. So here we, we have defined a triple. We call that triple number one. So a triple can be a subject. So triple number one being the subject here, predicate can be confidence percent, and the object of that is 70, and that's just what is stored. And so all these triples get stored, gets rendered into the graph, and uh, gets thrown into the algorithms that you run upon it. Triple, a little bit more on that. As I mentioned, comprised of subject, predicate, object. You can have a lot of fun with this. Bob is 35, Bob knows Fred, William likes running, and so on and so forth. Now, if you have any questions for myself or Gaurav or Steve on graph databases, feel free to be putting those in now to the Q&A, which we're getting really close to, but here's my conclusion. Okay, graph is a fast-growing data category. It's all about the use case. Here's what's good for graph uh, among others, but these are some of the big ones. Real-time recommendations, fraud detection, network and IT operations, actually mapping your network, identity and access management, looking up permissions, uh, supporting security in that way, doing different forms of graph-based search, maybe based upon some of the algorithms that I shared with you today. Identifying relative importance, and this is the thing that I, uh, I keep coming back to, and that's what these algorithms do. And that's why I spent a little time on them here today. 
So you can see it's maybe more, maybe more than what you uh, thought. Uh, Reimagine your data as a graph. It's easy to do. You can go to the whiteboard. You can do that domain model. That's it. That's your physical model. And then the data would naturally fall under that model, sort as triples. And if you remember nothing else from the algorithm section, remember page rank. Remember how Google does it. And you can do a little piece of what Google does with these algorithms in your shop. And page rank to me is just kind of the quintessential graph database algorithm because it brings out what's important. And that allows me to focus as a business. And we know we must focus with our limited time and resources. And graph is really great for helping us get to that. That has been my part of today. And now I'll turn it back to Shannon, who's going to share your Q&A with us. William, thank you so much uh, for this great presentation, as always. And uh, if you have questions for William and for either of the our sponsors today, feel free to submit them in the bottom right-hand corner in the Q&A section of your screen. And just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording of the presentations. Uh, and so let's dive in here. Um, will graph databases be a suitable data source for data science since they usually prefer flat tables? And William, let's kick it off with you and then, and then we'll open it up to everybody. I'm going to say uh, that science is a broad category, so let's let's you know let's break that down. But uh, as I did mention in my presentation, a lot of the initial application of graph database was in the scientific community, and it continues to be true. And they continue the scientific community continues to be leaders in the use of graph database. So, but in terms of data science, in terms of drilling in, uh, you saw some of the algorithms here today. They get way more complicated than what I showed you here, uh, and way more nuanced. And that, to me, is, is really representative of, of data science, right? Trying to understand things in the network that are hard to understand otherwise. And so I would say yes. I, I see it being, I'm not sure where the question was coming from, if it's you know, science uh, uh, domain or the, you know, data science. But yeah, I, th I see it as being part of both of those, the science domain and, and part of data science, a really strong part of it, too. And uh, I welcome Steve Rigorov to add to that. Yeah, if it's okay, I'll add a couple of client examples from TigerGraph. Uh, we have one of the Fortune 10 healthcare providers actually using, and the data science team within that, using TigerGraph to map out customers' wellness journeys and understand where uh, people have gaps in those journeys when people are going off of what is recommended in terms of medications, in terms of physiotherapy after a surgery, and then taking proactive actions to make sure that the members stay on the path and they don't have to have a resurgery, for example. So um, we are also being used by uh, pharmaceutical industry for improving on the clinical side, uh, dr targeting drugs better, because ultimately it's a network or connected set of entities on, in genomics, and also on the commercial side to make sure that the right drug is delivered to the right audience who needs it. Um, so those are some of the examples of scientific community actively using in pharmaceutical as well as healthcare uh, graph databases. Yeah, and William, I'll just say that, you know, I, I think you nailed it with you really focusing on the algorithms. Uh, one of the things that is really required with data science um, is that the flexibility around the algorithms, using relationship information in the algorithms. And uh, so will graph databases be a suitable, suitable data source for data science? I think they'll be a suitable, suitable place in order to do your data science and perform your customized algorithms. You know, that's one of the things that we're looking at uh, expanding quite a bit in, in our platform. And I know uh, most of the graph databases have a pretty wide selection of both algorithms that are included as part of the platform and ones that you can customize and, and build yourself. So uh, yeah, I think it's really important to data science. Great. Shannon, any other questions? Oh, yeah, lots of questions coming in here. So, um, uh, well, graph database, oh, so I already got that going. Um, so we've got it going on here. Um, what should it be uh, the approach to identify nodes and vertices relationships? And I know, Grav, you've already supplied an answer here in the written form. Um, Steve, do you have anything to add to that? 
Uh, whew, that's a that's an interesting one. I mean, that, that's a natively what a graph database does, right? So to pro, to uh, identify nodes and vertices and relationships in in uh, data. So um, I I think I need more clarification on the question to answer that. That's what we do. <laughs> sure, absolutely, indeed. William, anything you want to add? Yeah, I'll add, I'll add something to that. Uh, usually the confusion is what to model as a vertex. Ah, okay. And what to model as, uh, so that, that'll help you, Steve. Uh, what to model as a vertex and what to model as an edge uh, or an attribute. Um, especially, you know, you can model the same, uh, some model something as an attribute, uh, like name, email, address, phone number, or you could also model it as a vertex. So it depends on the type of search that you want to conduct and the algorithm that you want. Yep. Yep. There's a little bit of a context around it. Depends on your workload. Yeah. Yeah, it depends on your workload. And I'll, I'll make it even more complicated, right? You can you can do uh, subject predicate objects or you can do properties as well, and that will make it even more complicated. But it's it's not that it's uh, complicated. I, I would say on the positive side, flexible, right? So it depends on your workload and what you want to identify. Um, so, is there any advantage to building uh, machine learning in graph databases at all, um, considering uh, the, the technology? So, again, Steve, I'll kick it to you first. I, I think the, the, the challenge with machine learning is, um, and I, I touched upon sort of the data harmonization aspect of it, right? So, um, you can put uh, X amount of data into machine learning algorithms. They may get you the results that you want or not. Uh, and so part of doing data science and machine learning is to uh, let's go out and try to bring in additional data sources and see if they uh, can be better predictors for machine learning algorithms. So, you know, I think it's the combination of the, the algorithms and the harmonization that really gets you the value with graph. Um, and that's how I'll answer that. Yeah, there are there are three things that uh, people do with TagiGraph with machine learning. First thing is we generate machine learning features for machine learning. We generate graph-based analysis features of the network data. We do it for um, healthcare. We do it for telecom industry. We do it for financial services. And that's the first thing. And that training data is fed into an ML solution to make it more accurate for fraud, for recommendation engine, and a host of other use cases. The second thing that we do with machine learning is natively inside TigerGraph, we do community detection, page rank, minimum spanning tree, and a host of other algorithms. And as Steve correctly, greatly pointed out, and as William talked about, algorithms is the key. So page rank, community detection, these algorithms doing those at scale on the graph data is what customers do with, with our product. And the third one is explainable AI where you're trying to understand what is the decision that was made by an ML solution, a machine learning solution, and how did they come about that? So the features that we compute uh, based on graph analytics is actually being used by people to explain why a particular customer was flagged as high risk for fraud, or why a particular recommendation was made for a customer in terms of a product or service. William, anything you want to add? Um, I, I like that answer. I would, I would just add that what I've seen is that Graph databases can, pro can provide focus to machine learning algor algorithms. And I think that they, they kind of are growing up now together in an organization and working together in that way. And William, can you comment on graph database usage in uh, context of GDPR? Well, uh, GDPR is all about be, you know, being able to understand uh, what customer uh, information that you have who has it and all sorts of uh, attributes about the, the customer so that you can get rid of it, uh, so that you understand completely how that data is being used. And I talked a little bit about how uh, networks are being modeled internally and the connecting points there. And I think that is you know, one place where uh, graph databases can support GDPR is by having a better sense, a better understanding of how the networks uh, are connected in an organization and where data might be flowing and uh, you know, places to chase down uh, customer data and so on for uh, GDPR and other things. The right to be forgotten, right? Yeah. Um, Steve or Grab, anything you want to add? Well, I think the next generation of you know using a graph data for the database for this would be to sort of create a, a data fabric. You might have heard that, and you know maybe that's a, a topic for another. Uh, uh, webinar, but 
you know, very often graph databases are the engine behind a data fabric where we can actually you know, take a look at all of our data sources and say, okay, which ones do we want to make uh, applicable to this analysis? Uh, and you, you know, essentially, when you have that right to be forgotten, you want to make sure that you look at all of your data sources, create this fabric, and then uh, make sure that the, the rules apply to all the, the sources that you have, all the data sets that you have. So I, I think you know, it, it doesn't become important until you start to begin that data fabric, that sort of layer on top of all of the data in your, your enterprise um, that uh, will allow you to do that. Great points, William and Steve. I'll just add to that, that uh, data lineage in general that meets, that's required for GDPR um, as well as CC, uh, CCPA, the California Consumer Privacy Protection Act, uh, both of those are covered by data lineage solution. Um, so we actually work with multiple customers to do this, and we actually have built out a target on Target Graph Cloud for data lineage, which would release in a couple of weeks. All right, well, I'm afraid that is all the time we have for today. We are right at the top of the hour. Thank you, William, for another fantastic presentation and uh, webinar in this series. Appreciate it, as always. And thanks, a special thanks to Tiger Graph and to Cambridge Semantics for helping us make all of it happen. Uh, and just a reminder to all of attendees, I will send out a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides, links to the recording, and all additional information. Thanks, everybody. I hope you all have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, so.